we've been looking for somebody who could who could do an episode on on snake breaking and who was doing it in a way that uh really, really works and really, really sticks with these dogs. And so I started researching you after John recommended, and I, I realized that you're actually almost more of a reptile geek than a dog trainer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think I love all animals and grew up with dogs. And so, you know, the dog the dog part was always there, um, but also I'm fascinated with reptiles and, and other animals too. And so, uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of background with both, and I would say originally leaned more toward the reptile side. Had some other snakes and things growing up, and tarantulas and whatnot, and and uh, yeah, so I like both, and you, you kind of have to in this line of work. <laughs> mm-hmm. Talk about how you do it. Yeah, so we do a, a pretty thorough four step process. Um, so we we use two rattlesnakes and then two supplementary steps um, for the the very first step. We use a small rattlesnake and, and also depending on where we're doing the training, because we do do all over Arizona, you know, for up in the mountains versus down in the Phoenix area, we might use different kinds of snakes. But typically in the very first step, we use a Mojave rattlesnake uh, on the smaller side, you know, anywhere from 12 to 18 inches or so. Uh, and it's muzzled, so it can't bite. Both the snakes we use during the training are, are rendered harmless with a, a special medical tape that we use to keep their mouth shut. Um, so they can't hurt the dogs, obviously, but it's humane and uh, works great, obviously. And um, so the snakes can still see and breathe and act like a regular regular rattlesnake. They just can't get their mouth open. They, can they so, can they strike too? Then, yeah, and I mean, kind month, of poke. <laughs> yeah, anyway. everyone it's more of a yeah a lunge. Um, they they can't get their mouth open, so there's you know no threat to it. But we've got a good collection of snakes, and we've used the same ones for years. They're kind of on a rotation, a work rotation. And uh, they're pretty used to this. So most of the time they don't strike. They'll still rattle and move around and do what I need them to do. But they're pretty reluctant to strike just from the, you know, constant appro- being approached by dogs and handled and things like that. So they're, they're pretty good about not striking to begin with. Plus they're muzzled. And, and you're muzzling them because you're not, you don't defang them or milk them, right? Yeah, we don't defang them. There's, there's some safety issues with that. I mean, Working with rattlesnakes in general, there's always safety issues, but um, we don't defang for ethical reasons. But then also, um, they and a lot of people don't know this, kind of like shark teeth, they shed their fangs and regrow new ones pretty regularly. And so there's concern, and this I've heard stories, horror stories of it happening, where a, a defanged snake, um, you know, the person, whatever method they use, got the fangs out of there, assumed it was good, and a backup set was really already growing in and ready to go. And I've heard stories of dogs being envenomated by a defanged snake. And so again, for ethical reasons and safety reasons, we don't do that. So that's, yeah, that's some thoughts on that. Uh, well, hold on a second then. How do you, how do you muzzle a snake then? <laughs> how do you, so you're taking a rattlesnake that has all its venom and yeah. all every delivery method it needs tucked into its mouth. And you're, you're, you're essentially using some kind of like skin safe tape, right? Yeah, so it's there's a, obviously a fine line between something strong enough to to stay on effectively all day long. Yet, you know, I can take it off and it doesn't like rip the snake's skin off. We we have to take good care of the snakes because they're essentially our employees. And so, yeah, it's basically a medical tape that um, it comes off like a band aid at the end of the day and doesn't you know harm the snake. They don't love it, obviously, but um, they can. We can do it again the next day if we need to, although we have enough now that we, you know, usually the same snakes don't work more than one day a week. So we've got a pretty good collection of them. How, how do you get it on, though? How do you get the tape yeah, on? Yeah, so I, I, I say that's kind of the secret sauce of the business. Um, so the, the the short answer is is very carefully. <laughs> um, but that's that's actually pretty much all there is to it. Um, we've... They have to, we have to restrain them properly and they have to be relaxed to get it on properly. And so we don't, um, I've had people theorize, do we, do we refrigerate them? Do we drug them? And we don't do any of that. Um, we basically just have to you know, get them under control and relax and then apply it carefully in a very precise manner. And I joke, that's what people are paying for when they use us is you're getting a muzzled snake, which creates one of the most realistic training experiences uh, for the dogs. All the parts are there in the snake. Um, it's out and moving and accessible. And so, I mean, the muzzle is literally the only thing that is different from a, a, a real encounter the dog might have in their own backyard or on a hike or hunt. 
So your step one is a, it's a juvenile snake, right? It's a little guy. Yeah. And yep. it's, I, th- I think I read that you're, you're exposing that, uh, that you're letting the dog discover it in a place where there aren't a lot of other distractions. Like it's, it's like on a flat concrete pad or something like that. Yeah. And so, cause we do this training in people's backyards, different venues, kind of all over the place. So I have to kind of adapt to whatever space we have, but the very first snake, and it's funny, we sometimes get criticized for this. I put it in very plain sight simply so the dog gets a crystal clear look at it. They know exactly what hit them when they get corrected and, and then they can't miss the snake. Um, Cause you know, obviously people are like, Oh, it's going to be in a bush or a hole. I'm like, well, sometimes it is, you know, and sometimes it's on the trail crossing the trail that you're walking on. Um, so really in, in the end, it doesn't really matter too much. Um, and the other steps we do conceal a lot more. Uh, but the reason we put it out in plain sight is so we know the dog got a nice clear look at it. So for instance, if the dog walks up to it and it's hidden really well in gravel, and I correct the dog, I don't actually know with confidence how good of a look the dog got at the snake. And so if I have a concrete pad or pavers or something, you know, it's obviously not too hot in the sun, but I can set the snake on in plain sight. The dog can't miss it. And it gets, again, just a crystal clear look at exactly what, you know, got them. You know, I say that meaning the caller corrected them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's what convinces them. And there's no if, ands, or but around it. There's nothing else around the snake they could really blame that correction on. It's just yeah. the snake sitting there. Yeah. Um, so it makes sense to them. And that's the really important thing about the training is we got to do it in a way that it makes sense to the dog what's happening. And then they learn. Yeah. There's no gray area there. It's, it's pretty clear that the dog is engaging with this thing. It's not supposed to be engaging with, and you know, when to give that correction. All right. Well, let's, w- what about step two then? Yeah. So after the little snake and after the, and the, what determines when we move on is, you know, once the dog's avoiding it. So meaning if they went up to it, sniffed it, we corrected them. They jump back and retreat and we, they don't want to go near it again. Then that's perfect. So then we move on. Uh, we try to reinforce the scent and the sound of the rattlesnake, uh, in isolated ways. Uh, meaning, you know, they won't always have the luxury of seeing the snake out in the open like they did in the first step. So we want them to recognize, even if you just smell a rattlesnake, even if you don't happen to see it or don't hear any rattling, we want you to avoid that smell. And then same thing with sound. If they don't, smell it or, or see it in time, but they hear rattling, they should know it or run away from that. And so basically step two is the, the scent supplementary step. We, we have a, uh, because we have a big collection of rattlesnakes, um, we have a big collection of shed rattlesnake skins. And so, and this is kind of key, the way we use them, uh, it works uh, technically a rattlesnake skin that you find out in nature. If it's been out in the elements for a while, it probably doesn't smell like rattlesnake anymore. Uh, so what we can do is as soon as our snakes shed, we vacuum seal and freeze the skin, which kind of preserves it basically. And as needed, we constantly change them out. So basically what we bring for an appointment is a, a very recently, well, recently pulled out of the freezer, fresh rattlesnake skin. Uh, I kind of ball it up so it doesn't look like a snake. And I use, I, we use tongs to handle it. I don't handle it with my bare hands or anything. Uh, so the only thing, it, I mean, it basically came right off the snake and went to this, you know, to the freezer and then to somebody's appointment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I basically place it somewhere um, strategic, you know, next to a bush, you know, near a log, a wood pile or something like that. And uh, this is where we'll get the dog, uh, depending on the weather, we'll, we'll get them downwind of it. If it's stagnant, we kind of take them right to it. If there's a slight breeze, we kind of figure out which way the wind's blowing. We approach uh, the skin from downwind. It's usually hidden pretty well, and so the dogs don't really see anything. It's But what should happen is they eventually pick up on that scent. And this is where uh, two things can happen, actually. I was kind of mentioning this earlier. If the dog got a good whiff of the very first snake when I corrected them, the real snake, um, they might already react to the skin. I've had dogs that, I mean, this happens actually a lot, where the, the second they're downwind, they react. Like they jump or something. You can tell it startled them. And it's because what happened is, you know, they got hit with that scent and they thought, wait a minute, that's that same smell that just zapped me a minute ago. And so some don't even need any correcting on that step because they got a good whiff of the real snake. They already know it and they're not taking chances with the skin. The other way it can go is a dog that for some reason didn't get a good whiff of the real rattlesnake or if they're just brave and they start looking for where that smell is coming from. I, we basically let them get to the source, so meaning, meaning the skin. And then as soon as they're really close sniffing it, same thing, give them a correction right then and there. And ultimately what that accomplishes is it kind of puts in their head, even if it doesn't look like a rattlesnake, if you're picking up traces of that odor, uh, don't go looking for it, you know, get out of there. Mm-hmm. And so um, after, after, after having to start on the very first snake, uh, usually with the skin, it's a one and done. I mean, they don't usually go back to that more than once. Um, 
usually after that first correction, they're avoiding that whole area too. And some owners want to see that. So I'll move the skin to a new area. We'll get them downwind and you'll see them avoid it on their own that time, um, which is cool to see just with how fast this works. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of step two and in a nutshell, um, just teaching them to back off from even just traces of the odor alone of a rattlesnake. That's interesting. What, what what's step three then? So step three is super simple. Um, we've got, uh, so it's sound. So we want to make sure that dogs uh, very much know to run away from rattling. And, and that's very important because as most people hopefully know, you know, that's a warning sound. And usually when you hear rattling, you're already too close, meaning the snake feels threatened and that's why it's making that noise. And so uh, we basically, now the thing is, though, well, we want to isolate it. So we don't use, you know, a hidden snake or, or anything like that. We want to catch them off guard with nothing but rattling. And so we use a speaker, like a little Bluetooth one, and we've got these uh, awesome quality rattlesnake recordings that I was able to take myself uh, using a fancy handheld recording device. But anyway, um, I basically got good quality recordings of a rattlesnake rattling. And we basically, and this is where the owner gets to be pretty involved. Um, we have the speaker hidden in like a bush or rock pile or, you know, whatever's available. That's a good realistic spot. And the owner simply just walks with the dog past that point, And then out of nowhere, I play that loud rattlesnake recording. It's very startling and very realistic. So I've had owners scream sometimes, even though they knew it was coming. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so basically right when that happens, I typically have the owner also run away. The dog gets a correction right in the moment I play it. And so that kind of creates the link between, you know, bad feeling and that sound. And so they usually go running off immediately, but seeing the owner and myself, actually, we all run away. That kind of helps supplement the message. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically we're teaching them to run away from rattling. And then so uh, after I play it, you know, at a good distance, you know, 20 so yards from the spot, we basically kind of calm the dog down and then let them sit next to us. And then we all just kind of sit there and listen to it for a little bit because I want to make sure they process and remember what that sound sounds like. And so we just kind of leave it playing for a little while. And uh, yeah, and that, that one's very straightforward dogs i think remember the sound best from the training and i think that's part of it is the the good startling effect of that step and uh yeah, it's very convincing and so and again the message there is even if you don't see or smell the snake if you hear a bush or rock pile or weeds that sounds like that get out of there yep. and so um, they do really well with that stuff, which is kind of a funner one, at least for, I guess, for the humans watching. Well, it, it, the whole thing kind of sounds fun. <laughs> I mean, I, I, th I think this is like, this sounds way more fun than a lot of dog training does. But yeah. the, the sound aspect is interesting because anybody who's ever walked up on a rattler in the wild knows how quiet they really are. Like, you know, yeah. in, in the old spaghetti westerns, man, they're loud, like it's maracas. But when you, when I, you walk up on them, like I've, I've encountered them along rivers you know, when I've been uh -huh. bow hunting and a lot of times I'll see the, I'll see the movement before I realize I'm even hearing it, you know, and I'm sure a dog hears it way better, but some, some snakes don't rattle. Some snakes rattle pretty loud. You just, you don't know. And so you're building in, Hey, anyway, you're going to encounter a snake dog. <laughs> Here you go. We, we want it all to be bad. Exactly. Whatever comes first, whether you smell it, hear it or see it, get out of there and leave it alone. Yep. Uh, step four. What's step four? Yeah, so this kind of technically after that sound step, the dog is more or less trained by that point. They had their visual encounter with the first snake. They heard probably some rattling, and and because uh, the first snake we use usually rattles at least a little bit, so they de technically already got to hear some rattling. They got to see it, and they probably got some smell. So again, first first snake technically hits on all senses. It's just kind of all at once, and then we isolate the you know the scent and the sound with the skin and the speaker. The last step is just kind of gives them a chance to pull all that together again. And so we end with an adult rattlesnake this time. It's also so they are simply aware that the snakes do come in different sizes. Um, so we end with a larger one. So, you know, the first one was 12 to 18 inches or so right in there. The last one, you know, down in Phoenix area, it's a, we use an adult diamondback, uh, which is anywhere from, you know, three to almost maybe five feet or just shy of that. And so, uh, yeah, we basically put that one out. And that one's muzzled as well. And this is kind of the, I joke, the, the final exam we basically put in the new area. And, uh, you know, the, the dog has pretty much got everything down by this point, And we get to see that. And so we bring the dog up to this one. And most dogs take one look at it and back off. Or if it rattles, they immediately run away. Um, so it's basically, to, again, give them a chance to put it all together again, see a different size snake just so they're aware they do come in different sizes. And, uh, and it gives a gives the owner another exciting snake encounter at the end and, and that's it.